Time for a deeper look into the markets. As you may remember from last week, Zach Ashmore has taken over that section of the show. Zach? Thanks, Mike. This week's deeper look continues our story on African swine fever, also called ASF, and how it caused China to import chicken from the U.S. That isn't the only meat they're taking in. There's more to the story. As ASF continues to ravage China's pig herds, the international markets see an opportunity by selling pork and other meat products to the Chinese. As reported by Reuters, last year China imported 1.33 million tons of pork from January to September, an increase of 43 percent from the previous year. Beef imports over the same period were 1.13 million tons, an increase of 53 percent. ASF in China has been a big reason that we're seeing some of the activity we are with this phase one deal. Uh, ASF has decimated the hog population in China. Pork is the biggest consumed uh, meat by Chinese consumers. So there's a big hole there that needs to be filled either with more pork, and we are sending more pork to China, but also if you think about beef and poultry, uh, Chinese consumers are, are opening up to that as well. Uh, they just need more animal protein in their diet. So I think that's been a big driver in uh, a lot of what we're seeing in this phase one deal. Experts predict that the price of pork in China will top out in 2022 and then normalize over the next few years as Chinese swine herds repopulate, though imports will be high up through 2025. The U.S. won't be the only country exporting meat to China. Europe is selling too, but is also at risk. As reported by Politico, Germany's agricultural minister has warned of ASF entering through their Polish border. The EU's largest pork producer is looking to cull massive amounts of swine should that happen. ASF isn't the only issue hitting China these days. Coronavirus has been a big topic in the news, causing the quarantine of entire cities to prevent spreading the deadly virus. What impacts will this have on the markets? Ag economist Arlen Suderman gives his thoughts. The markets are dominated by the funds, and price is still a function of supply and demand, but it's modified by the flow of money, so it changes how the markets operate. And with coronavirus, it brings back a lot of fears of the SARS virus in 2002 and 2003, where people quit traveling, commerce slowed down as a result, and therefore it was a drag on the global economy. And so the funds, they don't know a lot of specifics about the commodity. Some do, but a lot of them don't. And so they'll say, oh, slower global economy, less demand for commodities. So when, when uh, coronavirus hits the headlines, sell commodities. The phase one trade agreement and USMCA, as you just saw, have been big news in the markets recently. How have they affected the cattle markets? And what are the limitations? Farm Week ag economist Josh Maples fills us in. So with all of the trade deals we have going forward, how has it affected the cattle markets? So the cattle industry or the cattle markets in specific, you know, China is kind of a growing market. So if we think about USMCA, that's a pretty established market. Those are huge export partners for us. Again, it removes some of the uncertainty of U.S. beef going into that market. So that's a, that's a plus uh, for sure. If you look at China, it's, it's the potential. Potential is the key word. We just got back into China a couple of years ago. A lot of the non-tariff barriers, so if you think about age, source, uh, medications, those are the issues that are really, that were really keeping a cap on how much beef we exported to China. Phase one eliminated some of those. So phase one eliminated the age restriction on U.S. cattle or beef from U.S. cattle. And it also recognized the U.S. traceability system uh, as good enough to get cattle or get beef exported into China. What it didn't do is it didn't remove the growth promoted trade barrier. So there's uh, discussion in the phase one deal that uh, they're gonna work towards a risk assessment on that. So potentially, uh, if we could get that growth promoting uh, ban removed, uh, then that would really open up the market for U.S. beef into China. Our last story in the markets, a toast to corn growers and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Bolivian Foreign Minister Karen Longaric. The two signed an agreement recognizing each other's flagship liqueur, Tennessee bourbon and whiskey, and Bolivian Singani as distinctive products of their countries. Singani is a kind of unaged brandy made from white muscat grapes in the Andes Mountains, and it's been called the national drink of Bolivia. This trade deal would expand U.S. exports to the South American country while protecting each nation's native spirits from fraud and counterfeit. And if you like brandy, you should try Singani. Cheers. 
And that's it for a deeper look into the markets.